So I'm going to talk uh, about a single and simple question, how to become a great developer and have a life. And at this point, I have to admit that I have a split personality. Uh, that's, uh, I'm a software engineer, a developer. I've been doing it for more than 20 years now. And uh, I was not really interested in uh, becoming a great developer. All I wanted to do was solve problems and then give me some more problems, some more difficult ones. And that's how I learned. So uh, if you think that being a polyglot, it was only uh, I wanted to have more difficult problems with different languages. So this is all fine and dandy. But life had an other side of me. And uh, so I'm going to uh, tell you uh, my life, life in a few sentences. So uh, I had uh, a girlfriend at that time, and uh, we split up because she thought I was not committed enough. Okay, um, after a while, um, I had another girlfriend, and uh, then we split up for a completely different reason. She felt I was not committed enough. So uh, after a while, you know, I'm a developer, so I, I saw the pattern here. So what I did was I went to see a psychotherapist. I spent some, quite some time in psychotherapy, then I had a longer term relationship. And I actually got interested in psychotherapy. I enrolled to a four year cor course and I became a therapist myself. Now, um, Back to software development, because I was developing software at the same time. You know, I was, I was doing both. And, you know, and I was seeing clients. So this is a bit dizzy, you know, between the two states, uh, the two sides of my brain. And then I started to do something that came closer to these two worlds. I did some volunteering wor uh, work at the University, Technical University of Budapest. And I found something, something very interesting. Therapy usually, like traditionally, uh, works with clients. And if the client doesn't work the way the therapist expects, expects, him, expects him or her, the client is said to be resistant. So the therapist has to find some way around their resistance. So that's the tradi traditional approach. And um, also therapists specialize in something, in problems. This therapist uh, treats eating disorders. That therapist is good at marriage counseling. And what I got interested in was good clients. So I wanted to work with uh, clients and some clients were quite easy for me to work with. And they had a special mindset. And many of them happened to be programmers. So the next step was, when I started to work for Prezi, is to bring these words together. Uh, so I've been doing programming in Prezi, and uh, I'm in the process of setting up a peer coaching network. So I started to go to my colleagues and said, hey, uh, how about having some peer coaching? It won't hurt. And it didn't hurt, and it started to spread in, in Prezi. And uh, they, they, like others, started to do peer coaching as well. So what I'm going to do now is uh, make a bold statement. So if, if there are uh, therapists here, or managers, or HR people, be careful, I'm going to make a bold statement. And it is that programmers can be actually better coaches for each other than external coaches, or therapists, or whatnot. So this is my bold claim. And uh, I'm having a little theory about why it is so. So let's, let's see a client and imagine it's an almost empty screen with only this face of the client. And this client has an issue. So he 
goes to see a therapist. Therapist here. And the client has a number of resources and skills that she can use to get better. Now the therapist can tune into the skill of the client to a certain degree. There is another uh, skill that is not really matched by the therapist. There is again this skill somewhat matched by the therapist. And there is this skill and the perfect match. So they can work with these skills of their, or these resources of the client. Now, let's see another example. It's me or a programmer going to see a therapist. Okay. I had a problem. I want to see a therapist. I had all these skills I was talking about, and the therapist had all their skills and ability to tune into my skills and resources. But I had some special resources as a programmer. Were these resources matched by the therapist? No, because she was or he was not a programmer. I tried more therapists, none of them were programmers. I know what I'm talking about. So let's see another example. When a programmer has an issue and gives to another programmer, the client has their skills, the therapist has their skills, the programmer has his special skill set or resources, which are perfectly matched because the other one is a programmer. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is what we programmers share, what special resources we have. There are quite a number of them that can be used both in programming and in non-programming life as well. I will pick three, three important ones and talk about them. So the first one is when we get stuck, when we hit a wall. So what, what do we do? We try harder, the wall is still there. I take a step left, wall is still there. Take a step right, wall is still there. So what shall I do? There is a, one of my favorite quotes by R.D. Lang, is that the most important question is not what to do in certain situations, but what do you do when you don't know what to do? Now we programmers have a skill to oversee complex situations, to oversee complex systems. And once you know that it is a labyrinth, it's a maze, you will find a way out. So let's see, uh, let me give you um, a programming example, a low level example. And this is how I actually fell in love with Lisps and the enclosure. So there are uh, many inspirational articles by Paul Graham. And in one of his articles, he writes about the dual nature of Lisp. That when you're writing Lisp code, you're writing from the bottom up and top down at the same time. What does it mean? It means you're writing plain old code, but you stop every now and then and say, hey, wait a second, the language should include this and this. And what do you do then? You look up the standard library, and if you find it, okay. If you don't find it, what do you do? You write a closure or a Lisp macro for it. So you can actually implement other control structures, like unless, in Lisp or in closure. And it will look the same as it would, uh, as it, uh, if it's incorporated in the language up front. Okay, so you are creating a language. You, you have this special mindset, what there should be in the language. Now to see it from a higher perspective is that uh, when I started to do programming, all I could understand was, you know, a screen full of code. I could understand a function or a method. Well, it took me some time, but after a while I was able to do that. Then I could understand the whole module. 
than a system or application or even more systems interconnected. And I thought, that's the end of it. Okay, I know everything. And there are some other stuff, I thought. Like when there is a project to deliver, you know, you have to set milestones, deadlines, and all that managery stuff, right? We programmers don't like milestones and deadlines. And then I realized it's part of the game. It's actually part of overseeing a complex system by overseeing its future, by overseeing part of the system to be built from bricks that don't exist yet, and to oversee interconnected parts that don't exist yet. And we as programmers are pretty good at it, okay? To have a mental image of a whole system. So this is the programming part, okay? How does it apply in real life? This is where my favorite therapy approach comes into play. It's called solution-focused brief therapy. It's actually called brief because it takes only a few sessions to be effective, but it can be called brief because I'm telling you the gist of it quite briefly in a few seconds. So uh, it's aimed at solutions and it says that you can have a problem talk, talking about problems and details of problems, and you can have solution talk, talking about solutions. And if you talk a lot about a problem, it may not get you any closer to the solution. Okay, so this is number one of solution focus brief therapy. Number two is that if you come to me as a client, I will ask you about what, the, what is your hope, your best hope out of this discussion? What is your best hope out of the next month? Okay, that we are talking about. I will ask you to build a mental image of your life in the next hour, in the next week or so. Okay, and what leads there? Okay, so I will ask you to do the same with your life as you would do with a system, with a software system. And it magically works. Okay, so you do that and you will have it. To make them connected or to have a one, you know, I was uh, trying very hard to have tweetable sentences and this one I think is quite well. They see the hole in your head, so that's the point to see the hole in your head. And we, we as programmers are pretty good at it. Okay, so when we hit a wall, we can solve it by hitting, uh, by uh, seeing the hole in the head. Okay, so we, we could hit a wall, we could oversee the system, and it's many times that we have an assumption. So this is us barking up a tree, expecting a cat to be in the tree. Where is the cat? Ah, it's, it's in the other tree. Okay, so we had the wrong assumption. And that's the cause many case, in many cases, both in our lives, in, in our professional lives, and in our everyday life. They, we have a wrong assumption. How do we deal with them? I think that most exceptions are actually assertion errors. So when you are saying that I expect this this to be an object, but it's not. I will throw a null pointer exception. I expect this object to have a certain method or a certain attribute. Hmm, it's missing. So I will throw a no such method error. I expect the file to be here, but it's not. File not, not, file not found exception is thrown. Okay, they are all about my exceptions, uh, my expectations that are not met. To give you a real code example is, well, it's not the best uh, code maybe to do prime factorizations, and it code actually fails to do what I expected it to do. So I, I expected it to give me the prime factors of a number, but it doesn't. And um, I work in a polyglot environment, okay? So, well, probably most, Pythonist has uh, spotted the 
error here. The error here is that returning a, a P without a comma in Python, it's not a one element tuple. If you need a one element tuple in Python, you will have to put a comma afterwards, okay? And it's a quirk of Python, okay? It's, it's a bit different in every language. And every language has its own quirks. But you know, uh, the problem was that I was writing something and I, I thought what I was writing. And there was a difference between what I had in my head and what, what I had uh, on the screen. There was, there was a difference between my assumptions and the reality. This is what we do and what we are good at doing programming. How do we apply it in real life? There are two ways to do that. One is to have a smaller ego. Easier to said than to do. And I'm giving you a simple example what I mean by that. I have a colleague who, who came to the office uh, one morning and he was on call that night. And he said, ah, look, I was woken up by the alert three times tonight. Really bad. And my other colleague said, hey, I just checked it this morning and I saw there were two alerts. And my first colleague said, um, well, you're right. There were actually two alerts, but you know, three sounded better. And he was then right. Three sounded better, but he he had the guts or humility, or, or I don't know what it takes, to be able to see that the fact is there were two errors, two alerts. Three is what sounded better. So that's what I mean by having a smaller ego. The other type, uh, or the other way to handle assumptions in real life is to have an emotional control. Uh, you could see me uh, making some last minute modifications to my presentations an hour ago. And I was about to grab my laptop and hit it hard to something hard object. Because I almost screwed it up one hour before my presentations. And what I had to do was to be able to realize that, okay, so there is this emotion, this anger that I want to uh, damage my laptop. Will it help? No, it won't really. So I need to come back to the fact that, okay, let's focus on, on the job to be done. Okay, it's not easy. Well, I don't find it easy. So, uh, what we do as programmers is that we have the ability to respect the facts. And I remember having some girlfriends who were qu quite pissed off by this, that I can respect the facts in some cases where she lost her head. So this is our second resource that we can use many times. Our third resource is that me or us, um, being in the situation where when I'm feeling awkward that, okay, I hit a wall, I know I have a wrong assumption, but what's that? I can't find it. I should know it because I had a similar problem last week. I just can't remember. I asked my colleague. He could solve it in two minutes, but, you know, it's, it's painful and it's, you know, it feels awkward. And if I look around, my colleagues seem, you know, normal. It's only me who is so lame that I've been struggling with this problem for two hours. Must be easy. But if I look around even wider, I can see that other people have very similar issues. Now, how it works in our programming life is that we are actually pretty good at sharing our pains. And we have a number of ways of doing that. So first, there is rubber ducking. So you can ask someone, please come and be my rubber duck. I will tell you my problem. And the more you're explaining it, the more you realize, ah, oh, that's what, where I made it wrong, okay? And you probably know the feeling when the other one is just nodding, oh, yeah, I understand it, I don't understand this part. And the other party doesn't, like the rubber duck doesn't have to understand your problem really. Okay, we have another one, P 
pair programming that was mentioned quite a few times here. Okay, you have two pairs of eyes look at the same problem. You can even post your question at a forum or Stack Overflow or something. We are also good at sharing our gains. So it's us who uh, answer those very questions at Stack Overflow. And we, we write blog posts about our little victories. We can even contribute open source libraries. Th those are the bigger victories, okay? So we are pretty good at sharing our pains and gains. And how does it apply in real life? There is something, it's part of a bigger picture, called by researchers gift economy. The idea is that there are two types of economies. There is a plain old money-based one and the gift economy, and we are good at both ones. So when you go to a shop and want a bottle of soda pop, you pay money. Okay, plain old money-based economy. Then you go to your friend and you get a bottle of the same soda pop for free. You won't pay her, right? She would feel offended if you paid her. So this is gift economy. And we are programmer, we as programmers are quite good at working in a gift economy situation. So, uh, and I don't know if you have similar experiences, but many people outside of programming are envious of us. How well we can work together on big projects and share our knowledge. So these are the three main resources we as programmers have. And that's why I think we are pretty good, or we can be pretty good, of coaching each other. So, uh, given uh, your ability to build and uh, oversee complex systems, and your ability to respect the facts, please take the time to just look around. And maybe the person next to you is your best coach. Or maybe the person next to you is someone you can be his or her best coach. And I invite you to go home and create your own peer coaching network based on these resources. And then please tweet me back about your experiences. Thank you. And we got plenty of time to question for questions. There is a hand raised. Uh, can you tell us in which language most of your clients uh, program? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they are polyglots. Uh, I don't know how it's related, but you know, it's the good old uh, Scala, Python, Go, uh, Ruby, Bash script, Clojure, whatever combination. It's all, all, all of them, like this. Yeah, some prefer this one, some prefer that one. Okay, thanks. Um, so, when I picked up programming, it was all uh, fun and amazing. Now, I've been doing this professionally for just a year, and I learned a lot, blah, blah, blah. And, but I also realized how terrible uh, it is, how everything's broken, uh, languages, compilers, uh, editors, everything. And following Gary Bernhardt on Twitter certainly didn't help. And after that, uh, I come to work, I used to came to work, do my job, but it didn't bring me any joy. And I finally managed to overcome that, but I'm scared that it might come back. And you've been doing this for uh, 12 years, right? So how do you deal with that? More than 20. More than 20, sorry. Uh, ups and downs. I had a year when I said, no more programming ever. I went to do consulting, and then I came back. Uh, I, and I had some friends who didn't like programming anymore, 
and I convinced one of them to join our company. So uh, um, let's talk in the break. Uh, you're asking if being a programmer is paid the same as being a therapist? Uh, well, um, you know, it's... Uh, well, being a plain old programmer pays better than being a plain old therapist. At least it takes more time to build up enough clients. And the way I'm doing it pays the same as being a plain old programmer for this company, at least, for Prezi. Mine or my uh, job satisfaction? High. I have a high job satisfaction. Is it more fun being a programmer or a therapist for programmers? Uh, uh, you're asking if it's a more, I'm more satisfied being a programmer and a programmer's therapist at the same time? Am I right? Well, the most satisfying is this combination. That's why I'm doing it. So, um, great talk, but I'm not sure if I got the idea behind peer coaching network. So, you're saying that instead of going to a therapist, the programmer would be better off going to another programmer? Yes. So, uh, peer coaching network is that two of us meet, and we talk about something that's important for you. It may be work-related, or it may be related to your private life. They are many times connected. So you, you may have a, a, work, a problem with your colleague that affects your life, or you may have an issue with your, with your mom, partner, whatever, that affects your work. Both, both happen. Um, okay, but... I mean, I know at least a few programmers who would I would never be able to talk about personal issues. Uh, I don't know because they they didn't seem like persons that could you could have such a conversation with. I don't know uh, how your experience was, but definitely not all programmers are good at being mentors or coaches. Um, my, so what I'm uh, going to do soon is to set up a way how to help programmers become great coaches for each other in a few sessions. I think it's doable. Cool. So I'll follow you on Twitter then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there, there's a hand. Uh, you're asking if I have a template or a process for doing a session. And um, yes and no. Yes, in the way that I use mostly the solution-focused techniques, which are quite easy and uh, simple to grasp. And some part of the thing is improvised, so it's both. And the second thing, uh, do you think that the psychiatrist training helped you as a programmer? Oh, I like that question. I think so. Like, I can, I have a better emotional control now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I remember when, uh, when I had the project, I had to finish it on time. And you know, I was done with all, all the, the nice parts. But I had to debug some edge cases that I hated. So I was sitting there for two weeks, cursing constantly. My colleagues must have loved me in the office. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Thank 
Okay, so you can find me if you have more questions, but okay, yeah, there. Uh, yes. Uh, how deep do you think this type of uh, peer coaching can reach? So, like, can it replace cognitive behavior or can it heal neuroses? So, how effective can it be? What types of issues can it solve for somebody before they need to go to a professional? Um, my bold statement is that uh, professional therapy is overrated. So we, we like the idea of being full stack developers. And uh, I think, and this will be my last words, uh, that um, we can be full stack coaches, professional and real life. And I will answer you more fully in the break. Thank you, it's over now. <laughs>